Okay, so we are in our final ascent, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 through 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 through 15. So uh, last week, uh, we started chapter 11, and we're talking, the, the broader concern here is how proper faith is expressed through proper worship. So that's chapters 11 through 14, and of course, last week, we were in chapter 11. We talked about um, the Lord's Supper. In chapter 11, uh, we also talked about head coverings, and, and we talked about continuity and discontinuity. What's, what is theology and what's culture local to a certain place? That's important because it, it bears on how much of 1 Corinthians we carry forward and in what way. I mean, we carry all of it forward, really, but, it, but in what way? What's, what is it that Paul was addressing in his own day and age? And, um, and what are we facing in 21st century America? So that's where we're at. Uh, and again, we were looking at chapter 11 last week. We're going to be looking at chapter 12 this week. And I've simply entitled this one, To What End is Spiritual Gifts? So spiritual gifts are a thing. Paul addresses it. But to what end? What's the whole point of the talk of spiritual gifts? That's really what chapter 12 is all about. So here's what we'll do. I will uh, read chapter 12 as is our habit, and then I'll go back and make comments. So if you'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, here's what Paul wrote. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, to, uh, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he will. For just as the body is one, has many members, and all the members are of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would, the sense of, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many bodies, uh, excuse me, many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and on our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, um, which are more presentable parts do not require, excuse me. Let me try that sentence again, because that was a really long sentence. The eye cannot say to the hand, verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. There you go, Will, read in English. <laughs> but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individual, individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, and third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, Helping and ministering and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? 
but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. And then he'll go into the wedding text. No, it's not the wedding text, but this uses wedding. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so so far, chapter 12. We're going to start. It is. It is. Uh, yeah, and I should say, um, I, I failed to record last week, so sorry uh, for those of you who tried to go back and look at it online. I failed to record last week, um, but Jake, our new tech czar, set it up to where it records automatically now. So <laughs> as soon as I open Zoom, it starts recording immediately. So uh, if you want to say something to me that you don't want recorded and on YouTube for the rest of forever until Jesus comes back, and you notice that Zoom is open, please ask me to come to the side and talk to you in a sidebar. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be picked up by the microphone and recorded for forever. Okay. Um, but now we shouldn't have that problem uh, moving forward. If I can grab some time this week, what I will do is I will record me just going through some of the high points of the talk last week, and then we'll put that up there as, as a replacement. But it's, it's, of course, not the same as our um, in-study discussion. We're going to look at the first 12, uh, excuse me, first 11 verses of chapter 12. The first 11 verses of chapter 12. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed, etc., etc." Verse 4, everybody look at verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same spirit. There are varieties of service with the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in every one. Okay, so spiritual gifts. This is the perennial conversation amongst Christians and congregations. Uh, not just in the Lutheran, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, but across denominations. And people, um, they approach the gifts differently. Um, the first thing that I want to draw our attention to, and I, I didn't bring my Greek text, it's not in front of me. If I, rem if I remember correctly, verse 12, uh, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, that, that word there, spiritual gifts, uh, pneumatikon in Greek, so the singular would be pneumatikos. Um, so pneuma is the Greek word for spirit, so a pneumatikon, uh, the, the plural of pneumatikos, would be spiritual gifts. So that English translation is really faithful, okay? Now concerning spiritual gifts, meaning gifts that, that are not simply uh, natural gifts, first article gifts, okay? Let me give you the difference between a first article gift and a spiritual gift. No one would ever ask me to play um, a frontline position in football, okay? They may decide to ask Todd Reed, okay? <laughs> So that's an example of a first article gift. So by first article gift, I mean just you were born with it. Does that make sense? You were born with it. Um, a spiritual gift is different than a natural gift. A spiritual gift is one that the Holy Spirit gives you. And then we'll talk about why the Holy Spirit would give you that gift. Okay, so that's the difference between a spiritual gift and just you were born with it. Okay, so a lot of things that you think of as a talent, you were just born with. Um, or a physical attribute, you're just born with those genes, the, that genetic code, and that's what you're going to look like, okay? Um, <laughs> that's why, well, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that. Somebody told me this past week that maybe I just, I shared too much out of the top of my head, but anyway, so we're going to, we're going to back off. Um, I'm not going to share everything that comes in my head. But anyway, um, so uh, where was I? Spiritual gifts. <laughs> so these are the ones that come from the Spirit. They don't come from just your, you know, you were born with it kind of deal. And then there's another word here. If you look down at verse 4, and I believe it's verse 4. Again, I didn't bring my, my New Testament um, in, the, in the original language that Paul penned it in. But uh, if you look at Verse four, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. So that varieties of gifts. So he talks about spiritual gifts and he says variety of gifts. When he says spiritual gifts, the word is pneumaticon. So that's spiritual gifts, like gifts coming from the spirit. Everybody with me? 
But uh, when he talks about their varieties of gifts, the word he uses is charismata, and that's the plural of charisma. And a charisma, you hear charis. Charis is the word for grace. So these gifts, he changes the vocabulary, okay? You don't want to make too much of a word study. You really don't want to push it too far because words don't mean outside of context. But the point that I want to bring to your attention is that he uses two different words. One word is a spiritual gift, a gift coming from the spirit. He also has another word for the same idea, charismata, meaning a gift of God's grace. Okay? And the reason that's important is not to make too much of the different words and what they mean just in and of themselves in isolation, but rather to make more of the context. If he's talking to you about spiritual gifts, he's giving you two ways to conceive of this. The first way to think about it is that the Spirit gave it to you. The second way to think about it is that it is a gift of God's grace to you. But we're going to have to unpack what that means, because does that mean that just because you were given a spiritual gift, your sins are forgiven? Is it grace in that sense? So when we think of grace, we normally think of our sins being forgiven, do we not? That's because we're Lutherans. It's not our fault, okay? But the word grace in the scriptures doesn't just mean your sins are being forgiven. It has a broader sort of, well, the long-haired academic term is a semantic field. In other words, it has more than one meaning, okay? And so the other meanings that have to do with grace have to do with um, a gift that was given to you out of undeserved love. In other words, showering God's undeserved love on you. That can be for the forgiveness of your sins. It doesn't have to be just for the forgiveness of your sins. It can be for the living of your life, too. Everybody with me? So these, Paul wants you to think of spiritual gifts in two ways. Number one, they come from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has to give them to you. And number two, he wants you to think of it as God showering his love on you in an undeserved way. It's God showing you once again, I love you. There are different ways of saying I love you. You can say I love you. You can also vacuum without her having to ask you, right? That says I love you. If I go back to my dad's house in Nashville, he can already have this fridge stocked because he already went to the grocery store and he got all the good things I like to eat. That says I love you. Right? Yeah. You can uh, give someone a hug. You don't even have to say, I love you. A hug means I love you. Right? There's different ways of saying, I love you. So God can say, I love you by forgiving your sins, which we all need. He can also say, I love you just, hey, hey, you paying attention? I love you. Anybody else do this to your kid? Maureen. Yes, sir. I love you. Love you too. <laughs> hey, Mari. No response. Hey, Mari. <sighs> what? I love you. Uh, I love you too. <laughs> hey, Mari. I know you love me. <laughs> Anybody else do that? Is that just me? Okay. So um, there's the, you can't just say I love you just to say I love you. It doesn't have to be like, you know what I mean? Like sometimes we don't give God any credit for just I love you. You're part of the family. You matter. You matter to me. Everybody with me? Yes. So grace means more than just forgiving your sins. The Catholics, oh my gosh, am I actually going to give the Catholics credit for something? <laughs> Lord help me. The Catholics do a better job of saying the word grace or the word undeserved love, love like that, in the different senses that you find it in Scripture than Lutherans do. Yes, they do a better job than that. Uh, than we do. They do a better job of that than we do because they use the word grace in all of its different meanings. They use the word love in all of its different meanings. The reason that Lutherans do better at talking about grace for the forgiveness of your sins is because that's literally the only way we typically use the word. 
So because it's so specific for us, we do a better job of talking about the forgiveness of your sins by grace alone, through faith alone, and we don't bring your works into it. Does that make sense? Yeah. But because we, we have focused on by grace alone, through faith alone, for the forgiveness of your sins, for 500 years, we have almost started becoming like a one-note symphony. Okay? The word grace has more meanings than just the forgiveness of your sins. Okay? All right. Have I beaten that horse till it's dead? Let's move on. He says there are varieties of gifts, these, these, these pouring, you know, like this, this way that God pours out his undeserved love upon us. But there is the same spirit, verse 4. So in other words, it all comes from the same Holy Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities. It's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So, in other words, a way of talking about spiritual gifts is, do you want to know if the Holy Spirit is doing something in the congregation, in the community of believers? Then you should look at the different ways in which the Spirit equips people to be who they are in Christ. And when you look at the different ways that people are equipped to be who they are in Christ in the context of this community, then you are seeing the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's a phenomenon you can look at and say, oh, look, there's the Spirit. Does that make sense? In, um, in North American Pentecostalism, this talk of the manifestation of the Spirit is kind of truncated. In other words, it's cut off, like the highs and lows are cut off, and they reduce everything down to basically something like speaking in tongues. Shut up, blah, 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 blah. Oh, see, there's the manifestation of the Spirit. The Spirit's in the church. Shut up, blah, blah, blah. Right? Are you with me? That's a very narrow way of talking about the manifestation of the Spirit. The fact that Paul Markshausen um, has been gifted with from birth, a certain capacity to learn music, right? But really, music is about a lot of hard work. So in other words, the Spirit developed something in him, and he wanted to use it for service to the Lord specifically. So you, you can't find Paul playing in a blues bar on Friday nights, although there would be nothing wrong with that if he wanted to. I'm just saying Paul's not interested. Paul spends all of his time thinking about how to lead worship. I'm calling out Sarah over there because she's in class, so I can embarrass her too. Sarah wants to play in order to lead everybody in worship at 8 o'clock to the point to where the poor gal missed out on communion today, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> she took one for the team so that y'all could get communion, and she continued to play while you sang your hymns. Okay? That service to the Lord and that's a manifestation of the Spirit's presence in the congregation. And sometimes when we let Pentecostals drive the conversation, now I'm, I thank God for the Pentecostals, by the way, because they forced guys like Lutherans to ask better questions of the gifts of the Spirit and how is the Spirit manifested in the congregation. I thank God for the Pentecostals because they forced you and me to ask better questions of the Spirit in the congregation. We wouldn't have asked that on our own. It just wasn't part of our culture. It wasn't really part of our theology, so to speak. But when the conversation gets driven by Pentecostals, then the only thing that you can think of as a manifestation of the Spirit is, you know. Whereas when Paul's playing and leading worship, when Sarah's playing and leading worship, you're seeing a manifestation of the Spirit. That is a clear indication that the Spirit is amongst us. Y'all with me? So Paul says, don't miss those because those are clear phenomena that you can point at and say, ah, see there. Okay? What was that? So we take, we take that gift for granted. And we take it for granted, right? And Paul doesn't want us to take it for granted. Like the Sunday school teachers? Yeah. Yeah. show up, they do teach classes. Otherwise, do you think you're being reminded this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, when you see people um, 
serving we because he says right here right different kinds of service right mm -hmm. different kinds of activities but the same lord the same god who empowers this and everyone and so when you see these acts of service when you see people leading when you see people expressing who god has made them to be in the congregation you're seeing the manifestation of the spirit so when congregations go through um spiritual gift inventories and i think we have one laying around that we've used from time to time those are fine as long as we actually then plug people in um they're not fine when we don't and often let's just be honest here at faith we don't always do a good job of that yet yet you see what it said yet we don't often do a good job of that yet and i hope that we'll get better um and we're going to do some things that are intentional to try to get better at that but here's the other problem, too, that I find with um, spiritual gift inventories. They're a great place to start the conversation. They're a terrible place to end it. So sometimes congregations will go through a spiritual gift inventory, and then that, that's the end of the conversation. It's both the beginning and the end of the conversation. Um, but over the course of ministry, I found that people are often surprised by how the Spirit decides to empower them, even if it's just for a season. And this is where I want to talk about leaving open the possibility of other gifts that are not listed in the New Testament by Paul. Because as we approach the end and Christ returning, we need to be open to the possibility, to the idea that the Spirit may give gifts that he didn't give before because we need it now. And we didn't need it before. And that he gave gifts to the Corinthians, for example, that he doesn't give anymore because we don't need it anymore. Are y'all with me? So here's a good example of a gift that the Spirit gave once that we don't need anymore. Um, and the day of Pentecost, he gave the believers the ability to speak in other tongues, other languages. I want to make clear that the gift of speaking in tongues was never a gift of jibber-jabber, like it is practiced in Pentecostal contexts. That is so unbiblical, I want to throw the heaviest Bible that I can find at their head. Because it's not biblical. The gift of speaking in tongues in the book of Acts and anywhere else it was practiced was a gift of being able to speak in someone else's language and have them understand the gospel. Okay? So when Paul says someone has to be there to interpret, it means that while someone is speaking a human language that the Spirit gifted them the ability to speak, in order to proclaim the gospel, everybody else in this room who does not speak that language has to have an interpreter translating. So if we were on mission together and we went someplace where I'm really comfortable, like Brazil, eu começo a falar em português com as pessoas lá do Brasil que tem que entender tudo em português, se não, eles não vão entender o evangelho, Provavelmente, a gente também vai ter a minha esposa traduzindo para vocês em inglês. Pode traduzir para todo mundo? <laughs> Give her a hand. She's got the, the gift of interpreting. Okay. Yeah, y'all. They have y'all in Portuguese. Uh, I probably do, because I probably said vocês, and that's y'all. So. Um, so anyway, uh, when we talk about the gift of speaking in tongues, that's a miraculous gift that apparently was given by the Spirit for a short-term time because they didn't have Google Translate. These aren't people who studied other languages in schools, 
So either you grew up with other people and you already knew how to speak their language, or the spirit could give you in the moment the miraculous ability to in that moment switch. And for that period of time, while you're proclaiming the gospel, proclaim it in someone else's language and have them understand it. So that seems to be a short-term gift that the Spirit gave back then because they needed that back then. Now, we don't have the same situation, and we have new technologies available to us, and many of us may have gone to school and we may have studied one or multiple languages. We may speak more than one language. Does that make sense? So we still have the gift of speaking in tongues, some of you, I don't care how hard you try, you're not going to be able to learn another language. It's just not in you, God bless you. And that's okay. Every year when we get to, what is that? It's, it's uh, Ascension, I think. It's Ascension. Where we sing that hymn, your name, oh Jesus, be forever blessed. Right? Every year, my buddy out in California texts me, your name, oh Jesus, my name, oh Dennis. I think I've told you all this story. We went to Brazil. And I tried to teach everybody how to just say one sentence, like, my name is Todd. Meu nome é Todd. And if we went over it, we went over it. Meu nome é Todd, right? Meu nome é Todd. And then he, I did this with this guy named Dennis. Poor, poor Dennis. He's one of these guys that can't learn a foreign language to save his soul. So we went over it. Meu nome é Dennis. Meu nome é Dennis. Meu nome é Dennis. He gets up there and says, my name o Dennis, right? <laughs> Like, I need a ride in your El Truco to the next town O, you know what I mean? Just if you stick an O on it, it must be Portuguese, right? You know what I mean? And it just, God bless him, it just wasn't going to work, right? So we still have the gift of speaking in tongues, by the way. Um, and I wasn't born with this gift. I was born in Pasadena, Texas, otherwise known as the armpit of America, okay? It's not, a, it's not an awesome place. It's in the Houston metro area. It's crap. Glad I don't live there anymore. Oh, well, I shouldn't say that. He'll give me a call there. <laughs> I mean, I'm really thankful to have born where God decided I should be born. Anyway, so um, let me wash my mouth. So I was born in Pasadena, Texas. I was cared for by a Catholic lady while my mama went to work. And then my mama had a choice of where to put me in school. Now, my mom, she's a conservative gal in her beliefs. I have no idea why she did something that really doesn't fit too much else, frankly, that she's ever done. And I don't mean that as a criticism. I just mean it doesn't fit. She did something wild. She put me in a bilingual school that's, that taught in Spanish. I have no idea why she did this. But she did it. And so it meant that she wired me early to be able to pick up another foreign language pretty easily. Because if you do that to kids early, it's, that's the wiring. That's now in there for the rest of their life. Well, since then, I've had to know a bunch of different languages just to pass seminary. And I've had to know a bunch of different languages or learn different languages in order to work around the world. So I'm in Tanzania for two weeks, and I get up in front of the congregation there at the National Cathedral, and I start talking to them in Swahili. By the way, Swahili, like the easiest language ever. It's like so easy. I love it. It makes sense, and it's easy. So I start speaking in Swahili. I don't even remember what I said anymore, because I got to have to go back there and remember, oh, that's how you say that. That's right. Because like I wasn't really learning it. I was just kind of picking it up. And I start talking to everybody on the microphone, and the bishop looks at me like, what's wrong with this cat, you know? Here's what I really believe, and I truly believe this. You can believe what you want to believe. This is what I believe. I believe the Spirit told my mom to put me in that school early because he knew. So we still have a gift of speaking in tongues. It just looks different, and it's not miraculous like downloading out of the cloud. You know what I mean? But there was a time, evidently, when the Spirit used to download it out of the cloud for us because we needed it. We don't need it anymore. We have different needs. And we need to be aware that we may have different needs moving closer to the return of Christ, and the Spirit may gift people differently. Everybody with me about that? Okay. Have I beaten that horse to death? Let's talk about this. Oh, and by the way, one more thing to tie on. 
Paul's list of spiritual gifts here is not complete. He uses a different list in other letters that he wrote. And he sometimes adds in certain things and he subtracts certain things from his lists. In other words, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. So when I say the Spirit may take something away or he may give something new, even Paul never wrote about spiritual gifts as if it were an exhaustive list. And this is the only list. And this is how you should always look for it every single time. Rather, what you should look for, as he says here, is activities, service. In other words, is the Spirit gifting people with certain kinds of abilities to the situation in ministry? So when Joel Stoltenow came to this congregation, he came already equipped to teach, and he was a teacher. Now the Lord has been gifting him in a different way and equipping him when it comes to engaging the community at the level of social services and the like. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I'm picking on Joel here because he's not here in person. He's online, and so I'm going to pick on him. But the, the Lord is gifting him in a different way for different service for like, you know, right now. It's not, it's not even a static thing in one person. Does that make sense? I want you all to think of it as a more fluid thing than we normally think of it. Yeah. Well, there's the, there's the dynamic of how he matches spiritual gifts with our natural abilities, too. Mm -hmm. So unpack it. How does he match it? How do you see him matching our spiritual gifts with our natural abilities? Well, it can be different in different people. And so that spiritual gift is going to manifest itself differently with your natural talent. You know, if you've got a natural talent to speak, the ability to yeah. speak in tongues or whatever is going to be a lot different than if you, you know, you're a guy like me that can't put a sentence together. But I can't speak another language anyway, so it doesn't matter. But, you know, it's... I do know what you're saying. Um, so you you like to to write things out and think it through before you get up there and and say something. Whereas um, I feel very comfortable with verbal communication. I might be able to shoot from the hip, right? Um, but these strings can also be weaknesses. If I feel comfortable shooting from the hip, maybe I'm tempted not to prepare like I should, right? So in other words, when you think about spiritual gifts, think of it as a more fluid thing. Think of it on a spectrum. Be open to how the Lord is gifting different ones of you in the congregation for service, but look in terms of service and where the Spirit is leading us in terms of how the Spirit might be equipping us. Because he doesn't equip you just for the sake of, ooh, Will has gifts to speak. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, who cares? That's not the issue. The issue is, do we need somebody preaching? You know what I mean? So look at what, where the Spirit is leading in ministry and then look around to each one of you and see how God may be equipping you for that service to match the need in the ministry context. Does that make sense? Outside my own head? Okay. <clears throat> and then even if you have a natural ability, it has to be developed. So Dan's about to come on board. <laughs> right? He's got a lot of natural abilities, including, by the way, communication. But he don't know how to preach yet because that's a different thing. So we'll have to take what he's already got, and the spirit is going to have to develop in him the ability to preach, which is a different form of communication that he's used to. Okay? Yes. Do we have a question or comment? Yes, yeah, Stu. When you're completely focused on the will of God and how he wants to utilize you in, in reaching others and in serving others, yes, you will find that what gets developed in you by the Spirit, and the Spirit is developing in the congregation as well. In other words, when we develop one another, that's the Spirit's work. I mean, does that make sense? then yes, you will see the Spirit developing things in you that have to do with serving others, reaching others for Christ. It's going to happen.
Okay. Um, let's look at verses 12 through 31. So I've entitled this section, where would the body be? Because that's the, um, the question that Paul asked in, in, in verse 19. If I were a single member, where would the body be, right? When we talk about membership in the church, we've often talked about it in ways that are more like corporate America and more like American manufacturing. So how do you, how do you make new members? And then we have a cookie cutter process for making new members. You do this, then you do this, then you do this. And it kind of reminds you of making cogs. You know what I mean? It kind of reminds you of manufacturing parts. But when Paul says member here, he doesn't mean member the way you and I think of member of a country club or member of Congress or member of, you know, a corporation. He doesn't use the word member that way. When he says member, what is the, actually the word that you and I would normally use for that same concept? What? No, you don't use that word. Maybe if you say body parts, you use that word, but you don't normally use that word. What word do you use? For your heart. What do you call your heart? What do you call your brain? An organ. What do you call your eyeball? It's an organ. So in other words, the word he keeps using, member, the word you, you're used to using is organ. Okay? So what's an organ? An organ is something, not like a pipe organ. <laughs> Somebody's already going there. <laughs> it's not a piano, right, yeah. Uh, an organ is a part of the body, right? It's a part of the body that is fundamentally different like in what it is, it's fundamentally different from all the other parts of the body. And yet it's complementary in that it fits into the overall functioning system of the body. Does that make sense what I'm saying? A liver is fundamentally a different thing than a heart, but neither one of them can survive on their own. They must be together. And then they form part of an overall system that functions really in amazing ways. <laughs> The human body is amazing, okay? Yeah, you can call it an organization. Yeah, there you go. An organization. So, I mean, so what Paul's talking about, he says that the, the head is not the foot, the foot is not the hand, the hand is not the eye. He's talking about organs in a body. It's okay to be fundamentally different from the other people you go to church with. In fact, I would argue it's a good thing. It's a godly thing. It's a divine thing. The problem is when we forget that we need the others who are fundamentally different from us in some way. Thank God it takes all kinds. Amen? Amen. Um, so we were doing, excuse me, I got so tickled. I snotted myself, excuse me, <laughs> which is gross. Excuse me as I wipe my schnoz. Okay, so we were doing BCE interviews. I'm going to pick on Rick over here. We were interviewing prospective future directors of Christian education to come be part of our staff this past week. And we were talking to a, a guy who is so ridiculously organized. If, if it ends up being this guy, it could be this guy, it could be a gal. We looked at, at two of them. But if it ends up being this guy that gets placed with us, he is so ridiculously organized. And you could tell that he thinks of everything through like an org chart. Like there's a flow chart. He puts it down on a piece of paper. Ridiculously organized, okay? Remind me of like a Shane Sutton, right? Or like a Rick, right? Somebody like this. Somebody's like super organized in their thinking. And so Rick at one point just says to him out loud, like he didn't even think it. He just, well, he did think it actually. Krista made him say it now that I remember it. Like, he thought it and it was over a Zoom call and he made a face. He just made a face and he wasn't going to say it. And then Krista made him say it. She's like, Rick, you got a face going there. What are you thinking, right? So then, and, no, that's not what she sounds like. But <laughs> so she makes Rick say it, right? 
And so Rick just goes ahead and says it. He says, so our pastor is really good at like vision thinking. <laughs> you get what he's saying? <laughs> How do you think you would work with a guy like that? You know, because... <laughs> In other words, and I don't know how in the world we're going to get there. I just know it's that way, right? And I really do know it's that way. And I'll know it when we get there, but I have no idea what it's going to look like between now and there, right? And so Rick just asked this kid the question. I shouldn't say kid. He's a college graduate, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I'm getting old, so now these college graduates look like kids. So he, he asked this guy, this young guy, and he says, he says, can you work with a guy like our pastor? It was a fair question for an interview, right? right? This is what I'm talking about when I say you've got to look at, at, at one body but many parts. A guy like a Rick, a guy like a Shane, a guy like this young guy, uh, prospective DCE, these are guys and gals who are fundamentally different from me. It's a great thing. It's a great thing that we're so different from each other. Because if we weren't different from each other, we would never get anywhere, right? And that's why Paul is saying, if, if people were not honestly different from one another, where would the body be? So when somebody's got a certain type of personality and part of it rubs you the wrong way, like I said in the early church service today, just remember, you owe that person a Christmas hand because they're making you a better Christian, right? <laughs> because you got to learn how to be patient with each other, right? There goes my little gift from Jesus walking down the hallway, right? Because we are fundamentally different from each other, but it, oh my goodness, is it ever a good thing? Which is why conflict is not always bad. Everybody tries to avoid conflict. Conflict's not bad until it is. But out of the gate, conflict just means there were different points of view. And maybe if we listen to each other, we might come up with something better. Right? So conflict isn't bad until the way you enter into the conflict is poisonous. It's not the conflict that's bad. It's the fact that you're being a horse's rear end that's bad. Right? So just don't be a horse's rear end and then say what your opinion is. We all might need to hear it. Because you have a perspective because of the person you are. So the rules of engagement in a congregation should always just be just generally don't be a horse's rear end, right? Don't be the north side of a southbound mule. And then as long as you're not engaging in a poisonous way, conflict is not bad. Conflict is actually a sign that we're going to get somewhere. One of the things I appreciate about Dan coming on is that Dan has a gift for seeing conflict as something that you lean into. You don't back away from. That's a real gift for understanding that conflict is not bad until it is. It's not negative until it is. But that from the outset, it's not necessarily a negative thing. It just means we're different. And I appreciate that about him. Everybody with me? Okay. Um, so I want you to appreciate each other for the body parts that you are. Okay? For the organs that you are. And, and be glad that God has made you the way that you are. And now look at verse 27 and follow real quick just to end. Paul says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, second, uh, excuse me, then miracles, then gifts of healing, etc. So in other words, Paul recognizes that there's a structure to church. That's why it says first apostles then prophets, then teachers, then, you, you know, you with me? He recognizes that there are roles. Let me tell you where conflict in congregations goes wrong. It goes wrong when we don't recognize each other's roles. Without roles, you end up stepping on each other's toes because it means that somebody's trying to do something that wasn't their role. It's not part of their purview. You with me? 
So we have to pay attention to roles, not in terms of, and I'm not talking about titles. It's not a matter of titles. The kingdom is not a matter of titles. That's the world. The world is, how dare you talk to me like that? I am a sitting U.S. senator. <laughs> you know? That's the world that's caught up in titles. I am the CEO. That and a quarter will get your phone call. You know what I mean? We In the kingdom, the kingdom is a matter of roles, not titles. So in the way that we function to serve one another, we show the love of Christ and we demonstrate the manifestation of the spirit in how we show up for one another. Does that make sense? I don't want any of you to call me pastor because there's a title that says you're supposed to call me pastor. I really hope you call me pastor because when I show up for you, I act like one. See the difference? That's, that's my hope and prayer when I get up in the morning, is that I'll act like a pastor to the point to where you would, you would want to call me pastor. Because if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it swims like a duck, it's a duck, right? So the kingdom is not a matter of titles. It's a matter of roles. Therefore, the way we show up for each other is what really matters. And you hear Paul talking like that here in chapter 12. Everybody with me? I love you. Jesus loves you. Go away. I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>